the Tone Equalizer. It's another new module that Aurelian Pierre wrote and it debuted in Darktable 3. What it is, how you can use it, and why you might want to use it is the subject of this video. Let's go. Hi and welcome to episode 58 of Understanding Darktable, take 329. Seriously, I have had such a rough time of this video. Uh, before we get started, a couple of really quick things. I've got the desk fan running in the background, and as much as I pride myself on my audio quality, uh, I am not turning that thing off. It is so hot here today. It's over 40 degrees centigrade, uh, which is about 110 Fahrenheit. Uh, so I will do my best to filter it out, uh, but please forgive me for that. Uh... In the last 12 hours or so, Aurelian has put up his second video on the Tone Equalizer module, and it is hard going, I'll be honest. It's an hour and almost 50 minutes, uh, delves into a lot of really deep maths, and I'm going to try and break it down into something a little easier for the masses to consume. Uh, my apologies if I don't go into as great a detail as Aurelian does. Uh, by all means, go and check out his video. I'll put a link to it up there uh, if I remember to do that. And um, yeah, let's just dive on in. And I'll talk about some other crap at the end. Okay, so I've got this image. This is uh, an image from Sigiriya Rock in Sri Lanka from August of 2019. And as we can see from the histogram, uh, I have underexposed this image. Now, one of the things that was, I guess, a goal for Aurelian when he started to conceptualize this module and then start to work on the code for it was that he basically envisioned this module replacing base curve, shadows and highlights, and the zone system module. So in his mind, those three modules are now redundant. Now, even he will say, this is not gonna be your go-to mod go module every single time. Sometimes other modules will just do the job better. And we've seen that, we, we know that that is the case. I've, I've experienced that even with Filmic. Uh, so, with all of that in mind, what is the tone equalizer? Well, I think of it, out of those three modules, zone system is the one that I kind of see the similarity because with the tone equalizer, we've got a simple tab with nine sliders horizontally on it. And working from the top, <laughs> We start at minus 8 EV, which is your deepest, darkest shadows. You know why I'm laughing. And as we get to the bottom, at 0 EV, that is the brightest pixels within our image. So essentially, what this simple tab is doing is breaking our entire image up into nine regions of luminosity. So if we only want to affect the exposure of a certain range of our luminosities, we find which slider that relates to, and we can dial in negative values to reduce exposure at that luminosity level, or we drag it to the right to increase exposure at that luminosity level. And there are a multitude of ways to actually drive these adjustments. And we will come back to that later in the video. If we look at the advanced tab, we've got these nine nodes on the graph. And these nine nodes correspond to these nine sliders. They are the same numeric controls, if you like, or they affect the same luminosity regions of our image. You will also notice that there is a histogram in the background of this graph. Now, if you pay no attention to anything else I say in this video, and I've got to ask, why on earth would you even be watching if you're not paying attention? Please 
please, please get this into your head. That histogram does not represent your image. It represents the mask that this whole module is built around. Now, before <laughs> I can see you scratching your head and you're going, huh? Yeah, don't worry. We're going to get there, I promise. This is such a complex module. I am going to have to jump to, from A to B and back to A later on in order to describe the whole process. So just bear with me. So please understand, this histogram here is not meant to look like this histogram up here. They are two different beasts entirely. This histogram that we all know and love, that represents the distribution of luminosities and intensities in color channels of our image. We're all familiar with how that histogram works. This histogram here does not represent our image. It represents the mask. Okay, what is the mask? Right. We've all seen in previous versions of Darktable that was displayed differently. Now in Darktable 3, we've got this series of six icons which appear across the bottom of every single module in the darkroom view, right? And it's, you know, no exposure mask at all, a uniform mask, a drawn mask, a parametric mask, a drawn and parametric mask, and a raster mask. And you are already familiar with the concept, regardless of what module it is. You know, it could be the monochrome module, could be a color balance module, could be whatever. That you can go into the parametric mask and you can go to the L channel, which is luminosity, and you could then dial in something like this with the input sliders to say, I want this particular module, whatever module you happen to be working in, to only affect pixels within the image whose luminosity falls within the range of these four little triangular indicators, right? And at any point, we can turn that indicator on to see which pixels the module is going to affect. Now, for anyone who's new to Darktable and has not yet watched all of this channel's content, I do recommend you go back and watch the four videos on masks. I think it was episodes 13, 14, 15, 16 at a guess. Um, scroll back and have a look in the playlist. I'll go into a bit more detail about how to use the masks. Okay, so we're all familiar with this concept, right? That you can build a luminosity-based parametric mask in every single module in Darktable. And it's awesome. It's one of the features that when I discovered it, I just went, holy crap, that is awesome. Because you know, for all of you and me who were Adobe refugees who you know, escaped from Adobe prison, certainly the last time I used Lightroom, which was you know, over three years ago now, if you wanted this feature... You had to buy that as a third-party plugin. It wasn't even something that Adobe offered. It was somebody else who built it as a plugin that you had to buy. And then I come to Darktable and go, wow, there's luminosity masks there just built in and this is all given away for free? Wow. Right, so you're familiar with this concept, right? That you can build a luminosity mask using the parametric masks. Well, guess what? The tone equalizer module, you don't need to do this because the whole module is built around its own built-in parametric luminosity mask. Okay? And it's what this third tab is for. This masking tab allows us to control the way the parametric mask is constructed 
for our image. Now, I know, you're still scratching your head. You're going, what's this got to do with the tone equalizer? The parametric mask, which is on by default the moment you switch this module on, is designed to help us smooth the transitions between those nine adjustable zones so that if you were to go into the simple mode and do something absolutely stupid like this something you would you know never do in your right mind and create these absolute extreme adjustments to the exposure at different luminosity values across your image that would look absolutely awful under normal circumstances right but because of the default mask and its guided filter it's actually protected us from our own stupidity right if we switch that off go no to preserve details now it just looks like an absolute mess. We've lost so much detail in this image, it's just horrid. So that's how much the guided filter was protecting us from our own inadequacies, right? Again, this is one of those areas where I feel like I've got to jump around a bit to describe all of these things. So let's just reset that. Let's come back to the masking tab. Across the bottom here, you've got display exposure mask. And this, this is visible no matter which tab you're on, right? It's always there. And what that allows us to do is turn that on and get a monochrome rendition of the mask. Yes, it kind of looks like our image, like we're looking through foggy glasses, but it's actually the mask that we're looking at right and the mask has been constructed to try and soften the transition between those nine bands of the tone equalizer now how is it constructed and please stay with me i know you're going i just want to see how to use the sliders believe me you want to understand this first okay so first up there is what Aurelian has called a luminance estimator and there are seven different algorithms there to choose from the default is RGB Euclidean norm and I am not going to pretend to understand how they all work but they do generate a slightly different mask and what Aurelian mentioned in his almost two hour long video that he published this morning is that you want the estimator which will generate the mask with the most contrast. Now, in my experimentation, that has been RGB sum, but I suspect it may vary depending on the image that you're processing. So by all means, Try all seven of them out. See which one generates the mask with the greatest amount of contrast and go with that. Now, why is contrast important to our mask? Well, remember I made a big hoo-ha about this histogram here is not reflective of our image. This is the histogram which is reflective of our mask. Okay, we want to increase the contrast of the mask so that this histogram stretches as far across this graph as we can make it. Because at the moment, there's one, two, three, and a bit nodes that are actually falling within our mask. Right? Our mask is all these middle greys and only covers these four nodes, which means we can only use those four sliders to affect the way the mask is built and the way that then influences the transition between the bands of the tone equaliser when we get to that, which we will get to, I promise. 
Okay, so we want to stretch the histogram of the mask so that we can use all nine of these bands, right? So we come back here and as I said, there's this preserve details drop down with three options. No preserve details, averaged guided filter and guided filter. And the default is guided filter. And as we can see from this mask, like I said, it's like looking at our image through a pair of foggy glasses, right? What this guided filter is doing is ignoring fine detail, but trying to be aware of large scale detail. Okay, so we're not seeing the detail in the brickwork. We're not seeing the detail in the rocks on the ground. What we are seeing is things like all of the dark areas of the, the you know, this ruins on top of Sigaria Rock, and we're seeing our dark trees against bright sky. So we're seeing what Aurelian refers to as global details, but not local details, right? The beauty of this mask, which I'll dive into a little bit later, is just how well it is able to be aware of global details and yet still give us nice sharp edges on high contrast areas. To me, that is the greatest achievement in this module. We'll come back to that later. Okay, filter diffusion essentially is a feedback loop from one through to five. As we increase that, we are adding a second instance of the algorithm which is generating the mask on top of the first pass. So we're saying, make it fuzzier than before. And every time we add another instance, we make it fuzzier still. And as you can see, we're, we've now got a mask that is basically just a sea of gray and there's almost no detail preservation of any sort, right? And we do need to preserve some of the details. So how far you drive this will be dependent on other factors that we will come to later on. So let's just set this back to one. Next up, we've got the smoothing diameter. And the best way to demonstrate this is just to set it to a really low value. You can see what happened, right? We've still lost local contrast, like we still can't see the detail in the bricks, we still can't see the detail in the pebbles on the ground, we can still see global level details like the trees against the bright sky and, you know, the dark areas of the building against the sky. But as you can see, the mask is more splotchy. It's not quite as uniform as it was before. So this smoothing diameter allows us to say, yeah, just smudge it all a bit, make it all a little more flowing and consistent across areas rather than, oh, we need some darkness here and some brightness here and some darkness here and brightness there and that kind of thing. Next up, we've got edges, refinement and feathering. Now, I spoke about how well this mask can retain edge detail where there is high contrast in the image. And if we bring this up, we will see that it does exactly that. It increases the contrast in the mask. Again, this is not to do with your image. This is just about the mask between the dark areas and the bright areas. You know, and we've got these really well-defined lines. Now, this does cause a little bit of expense to the accuracy of the smoothness within the rest of the mask. So like everything, it's a balancing act. Okay, And once again, will be dependent on the, try the image that you are trying to process. Okay. Next up, we've got this section called Mask Post-Processing. 
We've got this dark gray bar that stretches the full width of the module. And within that, we have this light gray bar and this white indicator. This light gray bar represents about 80% of this mask histogram. Okay? About 80%, according to Aurelian. And what we want to do is get this histogram to be centered and stretched as wide as we can across this graph so that we can use all nine of our tools within the simple tab or the advanced tab to tweak our exposure across our image. And the way we do that is by using these two sliders, the mask exposure compensation and the mask contrast compensation. Now Aurelian kind of admitted in his video that there are some oddities going on with the code in the background here. At the moment, this gray bar would tend to suggest that our mask is too dark and needs to be brought up to the middle, right? Because ideally we, we want that little white line to be in the middle of this whole you know, dark gray bar. It should be sitting right in the middle. So this would suggest that it's currently underexposed. But if we look at the histogram here, it's actually a little bit overexposed to where we want it. We want it to be in the middle, right? So this is one of those oddities. So rather than dialing in positive exposure compensation to make this shift to the right, we are actually going to dial in some negative amounts and you can, you can see how that is jumping around, like it's all over the place, right? So there's definitely some weird stuff going on. On top of that, we can use the contrast compensation to force that narrow histogram to get stretched out. So we will dial in a little bit of positive contrast, like so, and we will jump back and have a look at our histogram. And now look at it. It's looking much more spread out than it was before. Now, Aurelian said in his video, you don't need it to go all the way from minus 8 to 0. As long as it's covering minus 7 to minus 1, you should be in pretty good territory. So I'm thinking we still need to apply some negative exposure compensation to the mask to shift the whole of the mask a little bit to the left and we maybe need a little bit more contrast as well. So we'll go back to the masking tab. I'm just going to dial in a little bit more negative exposure there. See, it looked like it was almost where it wanted to be and then suddenly it just went off the scale. Let's just dial that in manually. Okay, so now it's looking like it's a little bit under. So let's go minus 1.2. Okay. That's pretty close to the middle. It's not perfect, but it's close. But the contrast looks like it could still stretch a bit wider. But let's just check it over here first. Looks like we are clipping at the bottom end, but we're certainly nowhere near the extremes on the right-hand end. So I'm going to decrease that even further, just to minus one. Let's have a look at that. That's looking better. Still feel like it could come up a little bit. Okay, we've got minus 8 to minus 1 covered, so we're probably okay. Now, Aurelian has admitted that there is a tendency with this mask to get really saturated in the lower luminosities, where it just sort of goes into deep blacks and really deep greys quite quickly and quite abruptly. He's aware of it, and he's working on it. Looking at the rest of our mask, 
it's not looking too bad, but this sort of real dark area down here and this dark area down here and this really bright area here causes me a little bit of concern. So what we could do is either increase the smoothing diameter to try and soften that a little bit, or we could add another level of filter diffusion, which again has softened it somewhat, but we've still got, you know, dark areas in the bottom corners and this big bright area in the middle. Okay. That's the masking. And remember, all of this is being calculated so that when we start adjusting the tone equaliser, we are saved from harsh transitions between bands. Okay? So we'll keep that in mind and we will jump back to the simple tab. And we will turn our mask off. Now at the moment, we've done nothing to our image. And as you can see from the histogram, I shot this probably a good stop and a half, maybe two stops underexposed, okay? How do we now adjust the tone equalizer? Well, as I said at the outset, the sliders at the top represent our deep darkest shadows. Don't ask me. And the sliders at the bottom <laughs> represent the highlights. So knowing that our histogram is now, why did that change? Did I change? Oh, I did change something else because I added another layer of filter diffusion. So our histogram shrunk because we smoothed everything out a little bit. So maybe now I, uh, it's going to be a constant battle, isn't it? If I introduce more contrast, I'm back to square one. So maybe I'll just drop that back to where it was. Check my histogram. I'm happy with that. We'll leave it at that. Okay, so now we've got our mask. We'll turn our mask off. Now we want to start brightening some of the highlights because I've underexposed this, right? Now, we could come in and start just dragging individual sliders manually but that's a good way to make a complete mess of it. The way Aurelian has designed this cursor here is absolutely lovely. I think this is a, a great piece of UI design. What we've got is a set of crosshairs. In the middle of the crosshairs is what appears to be a grey circle, but it's actually two gray circles and a little bit of text on the right hand side and that bit of text tells us the exposure value of the pixel underneath the cursor as it was at the input stage to this module so before we've dialed in any exposure compensation right i said that there's two circles in the middle the outer portion of the circle will always remain a middle gray because it represents, in terms of luminosity, exactly what the text is representing. The luminosity of the pixel under the cursor at input, so before adjustment. The inner part of the circle will get brighter towards white if we add exposure, it will get darker towards gray and black if we reduce exposure. And you will also see there is an arc that either pops up from the left hand crosshair or drops down from the left hand crosshair to also give us a visual indicator of how much adjustment we have dialed in at any given point. So. The idea is that you will use your mouse wheel to adjust various portions of luminosities within your image. And what you will notice if you watch the simple tab is that when we dial in adjustments, 
They don't just happen on one band. They always affect five bands. Yeah. So if I come up here to the clouds and I start dialing in positive exposure, we can see from the cursor this little bit of an arc that's popping up from the left-hand side of the crosshair. We can see that the circle in the middle has now become a little bit lighter than the outer circle. And we can see on the sliders over here that, oh, I don't think I had all those reset. But basically the, fir or the bottom five sliders have all been affected by that one little mouse click. If I dial in one more mouse click, we can see the arc has gone a little bit higher up. The circle in the middle has gone a little bit brighter. We can see from our main histogram that we are starting to lighten up our image. And we can see this curve being dialed in across these first five sliders. Now, as we dial this even further, eventually our white circle in the middle will turn into black and white diagonal lines. Now, does that mean we've clipped our image? No. It means we've clipped our mask. Okay, the mask is simply there to help us, you know, have smooth transitions between zones. And so what we have done now is driven our mask to the point of clipping. Got nothing to do with our image being clipped. Okay, so I now have this nice bright sky with lovely white clouds and a faded blue sky above it. And now I can move around on other parts of the image and I might think, well, this wall, I might want that a little bit lighter. And I can see that it's currently minus four EV. And I can just dial in some positive exposure and we can see over on the sliders in the simple tab that around the minus four EV slider, that particular slider is moving up quicker than the two around it, but the two beside it are also being changed, right? Dial it down, dial it down, dial it up, dial it up. Okay, so it allows us to change the exposure at any one of these nine luminosity ranges across our image. But there's always overlap between ranges because of the way the tool has been designed. And in conjunction with the mask, this helps to create nice, smooth transitions across our image. It's not the kind of tool you're going to use all the time, but I can see that there will be times where this is an absolute godsend. And when it comes to HDR processing, I can see this being really helpful. Okay. So right now I've got a really nice histogram for my entire image. I'm not clipping either the, the darks or the whites, but I've got what looks like a really nicely exposed image. And we didn't have to go in here and tweak individual sliders. We just moused over our image and we dialed in whatever exposure we needed. And you will notice that as you move around the image, the text on the cursor changes to show you the value of each pixel at the point of input, so prior to any adjustment. But you can also see what adjustments are being applied to all given pixels simply by the arc that extends from that left-hand crosshair. Okay. So that's the simple tab. Now, as I said at the outset, the simple tab, if you want to, you can go in and adjust a single slider by itself, but that's really not the best way to do it. If we now jump over to the advanced tab, we can see that this curve here is 
analogous to the curve that we've got here, right? It's basically the same curve, just rotated 90 degrees, all right? And over here in the advanced tab, we can also grab these nodes and we can drag them up or down to change the way we affect certain parts of the image. And you'll notice that this curve is always trying to be as smooth as it can be, again, to reduce the possibility of banding. But you cannot change a single node without it affecting the neighboring nodes, as you have just witnessed. All right. There's probably a whole lot more I could talk about, but I feel like I've gone on long enough. This is certainly going to be, you know, somewhere in the vicinity of a 40 minute video, and that's probably more than you wanted to sit through. I will just briefly mention the curve smoothing, as the name would suggest. This allows us to smooth the transition between the nodes or to make it sharper between the nodes. I honestly don't think you're going to need to muck around with that slider very often at all. Okay, I'm sure there's more that could be discussed. Um, the mask quantization, even Aurelian said it couldn't really give an explanation of when you would use this, um, so I'm not even going to address that. I am going to leave it there for now, people. Uh, this video has taken me seven takes to get finished <laughs> for a multitude of reasons. One, I had uh, issues with uh, earlier development builds where the whole of my dark table became really laggy and I couldn't click and drag any sliders. I had to click and then wait about two seconds before dark table actually recognized that click and moved the slider and applied whatever adjustment that slider represented. That obviously made Darktable very painful to work with, and I wasn't going to even attempt to shoot a video whilst that was happening. I need to shout out to Coding Dave, whose surname I don't know. Uh, he just appears as Coding Dave on the email lists, and he is a computer scientist from Germany, and he has very generously given me a couple of one-hour sessions on TeamViewer where he has gone through and helped me to understand GitHub and repositories and cloning and fetching and compiling and building and installing Darktable from source. And no, I don't know it well enough to create a video on it, so I'm not going to go there just yet. But... Thank you, Dave, for all of your help. It has been a massive help. And one of the things that we were able to achieve with the second session that we did was Dave showed me how to run Darktable from a batch script and include some extra arguments which force the creation of some of the files which are normally created at the time that you run the application in user-specified directories rather than their default locations. And for whatever reason, that got rid of the lagginess. So it is because of coding Dave that I am actually able to sit here today and do this video. Attempts two, three, four, five were all me thinking I had an understanding of this module and then realizing that I didn't. And then this morning I watched Aurelian's new video, all one hour, 48 minutes of it, and realized, okay, now I get it. And attempt six was me sitting down and recording and realizing when I finished that my A7 III shuts off after 30 minutes of recording video, but it doesn't give me a tone to tell me it stopped recording. So I had to set a 29 minute timer on my phone to let me know to stop, stop recording, hit record again and keep going. <laughs> so we're finally here. 
So that is the tone equalizer module. In Aurelian's video, he goes into a lot of detail regarding how to use filmic RGB and tone equalizer together. I might need to re-watch that, and if I can, maybe I will revisit that in a later video. Uh, but for now, I think we're done with the tone equalizer. Any questions you have, any comments you have, please sing out down below. If you understand anything about this module that I've messed up, please call me out on it. I will not be embarrassed. I, I always own it. If I, if I make a mistake, you know, I'm not one to try and pretend that, no, 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 I know what I'm talking about. No, I am not like that. Um, you know, I, I'm as keen to learn as you guys are, as you, as you should know by now. Alrighty. Well, I think that pretty much does it. So I will catch you in the next one.